Friday, church. We are so happy that you are in the room, or maybe you're joining us online, or maybe you're watching this sometime later on YouTube or on the podcast, but we're so grateful, however you are yeah, at church today hearing this message, we're grateful that you're a part today. Uh, if you can tell, I'm in a little bit of a different setting with a, a whole bunch of our friends. We're actually here in Israel, and I'm standing on the Mount of Olives. And what a beautiful setting. I think it's a perfect setting to bring the message of Good Friday to our church and to everyone who's listening today. Uh, this is a special day in the history of every Christian. Good Friday is the day that we remember the death of Jesus Christ, the cross of Jesus Christ. It's sort of interesting that we call it Good Friday when it was such a bad Friday for Jesus. But that really is how the gospel works. It's good news for us because Jesus took all of our bad news. Yep. And so today, whatever you've walked in here with today, understand that it is a good Friday. It actually is good news because Jesus paid the price for your sins and for my right. sins. I start thinking about the cross, you know, we're up on the Mount of Olives and behind me is, is Jerusalem. That's the temple wall. Uh, the Dome of the Rock is there now, but at one point that was where the temple stood. Uh, right below is the Garden of Gethsemane. And somewhere over in this direction is probably where Golgotha took place, where Jesus was actually crucified. Our, our team went and we went to the Garden Tomb. And from the Garden Tomb, we could actually see a place that they believe is Golgotha. It's the shape of a skull where Jesus was stretched wide and hung high and he was crucified. His blood was shed. And in this place, you start getting such a glimpse and such new perspective of the good news of Jesus. The cross really is an execution tool. It's amazing, we wear it around our neck as a symbol, but it's more than a symbol. It's a statement. Yep. The cross is shouting at all of us. And if you've walked in today, hurting, discouraged, going through pain or suffering, please understand the reason why it's a Good Friday is because the cross declares God loves you. Yeah. Isn't that such good news? We don't have to wonder, we don't have to rely, do I feel loved, am I loved? No, there is a statement, there's a cross. God sent his only son, Jesus died. It's Good Friday because God loves you. But the cross also tells us that God understands your pain. And I just know today, as we're on this Easter weekend, maybe you're going through pain. Maybe you've lost a loved one. Maybe you've uh, had a dream die. Maybe you've discovered bad news this week and you're going, I feel all alone in my pain. Now the cross is that great indicator that Jesus, he empathizes, he sympathizes with your struggle, with your pain. God the Father gave his son. There is no temptation, there is no struggle, no obstacle that God cannot relate with. But I think the best thing about why it's Good Friday is because the cross tells us that out of the worst, God can bring about the best. Yes. Yes. Maybe you've had a really, really bad start to the year. Well, with Jesus, with God, he can turn something that's bad into something that's good. Yeah. How did what seemed to be the worst day become the best day? So today is really a day of us remembering the love of Jesus, a God who understands us and empathizes with us, and a God who can take bad things and bring good out of it. And one of the things that we love to do as believers is we love to remember the cross of Jesus through the act of Holy Communion. And today, when you walked into our services, um, you received the elements. And if you're, if you're watching this later on, uh, or you're watching this online right now, I'd even grab elements, grab some bread, grab some wine, because we're gonna take a moment to remember what it is that Jesus did. It's Friday but Sunday's coming. <laughs> we know how the story ends, but today we take a moment to reflect and to remember. And I want us today to look to Matthew chapter 26, if we can, for a moment. And um, we're gonna look at a story that is the Passover meal, but I've titled today's message, The First Communion. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 17, I want you to turn there right now. And I ask Manushka Charles, uh, to read the scripture. And let's just make a few observations as we look to God's word. Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 17. Monty, would you read for us? It says, on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, 
where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the 12. And while they were eating, he said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say him of one another, surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The son of man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to the one who betrays the son of man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, say, surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, you have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sang a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Well, it's a good word. If you believe it, somebody said amen. Amen. I, I want to preach today from the subject, the first communion, the first communion. And notice where this text ends. This text ends where we are standing and sitting right now, the Mount of Olives. But even before we get there, we're going we're gonna to back up. But Mount of Olives has all sorts of significance. Um, here in the Mount of Olives, uh, right across here, there's this valley. It's called the Kidron Valley. And all throughout the scriptures, what you'll see is that on this side of the valley, it's, it's the city of life. And on the Kidron Valley, it's over across it is the city of death. There's over 150,000 Jewish graves over here. And it's down the Mount of Olives that Jesus, he comes down the road and into Jerusalem. So just get this picture. He knows as he's going into the city of Jerusalem, the city of life, that he will have to cross back over to the city of death. He, he has a mission and a purpose. It's from the Mount of Olives that Jesus ascends. One of my favorite parts in the scriptures, the scripture says after Jesus is resurrected and then he ascends to heaven from the Mount of Olives that some believe, but still some doubt it. I don't know what you got to see to believe, but the man died, he resurrected. Now he's levitating off the ground. It's like, I don't know. Is he really who he said he is? Like sometimes we can see things with our eyes and we think that's going to produce faith, but faith doesn't come from by what we see with our eyes. Faith comes by the word of the Lord that's produced in our heart. We don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. But what's amazing is that from this mount, it says that you will see him again on this place, that we believe that Jesus will return on the Mount of Olives. He's coming back and this is where he'll return to. We know that from the Mount of Olives, after he sang that hymn, which we'll get to, he went down to the Garden of Gethsemane. Isn't it powerful that Gethsemane in Hebrew means olive crushing? In fact, they would take olives and they would crush it three times in order to produce the oil. How many times does Jesus pray in the garden that the cup might pass from him? Three times. Because Jesus in the olive pressing, crushing place, like an olive, is being pressed three different times because from him oil will be produced. The Mount of Olives is, is a significant place. And we'll see here in a moment that they ended their night before they go to the Garden of Gethsemane singing a hymn. But before we get here, let, let's go back a little bit. Jesus is getting ready to have his Passover meal with his disciples. Passover is all about really one word, and that word is gratitude. Everyone say gratitude. gratitude. I mean, you know, gratitude produces love. If you're not thankful for something, you're not going to love it. That's why we always say you can, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. When I, when I love something, I'm drawn to it. I'm going to do something. And over and over again, we want to take time. That's what Good Friday is about. It's about remembering what Jesus did because then it's going to produce the love I have for Jesus. And so Jesus, who's Jewish, we are here in Israel, he's getting ready for the Passover meal and he gets his disciples. And I sort of love it because I think there's lots of fun observations. Notice he's going to have, the, he's going to have Passover with the 12 disciples. Like, I don't know about you, but guys, when it comes to you know, planning a party, I, I desperately need my wife involved. I can't imagine trying to plan a party with just me, Nick, and Chris. 
and David D. Like, just like them, they were a little bit late to the game. The disciples are going, yo, where are we actually having this meal? Um, who's preparing it? And they come to Jesus. I can see they're a little bit worried, like, what's the plan here? And in Mark and Luke's account, he actually sends them into the city and says, you will see a certain man. It just says in Matthew's gospel, a certain man. We know that the certain man was signified by holding a jug of water. We believe this is a holy setup because in that time period, men would not carry water, meaning the disciples sense a problem at hand, but before they can even get the problem out of the mouth, Jesus already has a solution prepared. That's good news for all of us that when we bring problems to Jesus, trust me, he already has a solution in mind. Trust him. He's made a way when there seems to be no way. There's a certain man who will show you a certain place where we will have the feast. The scripture says that they're brought up into this place. And as you go into it, Manu was just reading, notice who's at the table. It's all 12 disciples, including Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot is the disciple who betrays Jesus. I just want you to see just, once again, another shade, another aspect of the beautiful grace of our God, that he's having his final meal, his last meal, and he chooses to have the one who is about to betray him join the meal. That's like, imagine like being on death row and you're having your final meal, whatever you're picking. You're like, hey, by the way, can you get the guy who's gonna pull the lever for the electric chair? I'd like to jo have him join us for the meal. Nobody would do that. This is what separates Jesus from everyone else. He has this inexhaustible grace. In fact, in the Garden of Gethsemane, yeah. when Judas does betray him, the last words Judas ever hears from Jesus is, friend, do what you came to do. Wow. Calls him friend. Wow. That's the last thing I'm gonna call him. In John's account of the story, Jesus takes time to wash Judas's feet. Wow. Why would you wash the man's feet who's about to run and betray you? But please understand, this is not a one-time thing for Jesus. How many you know Jesus healed hands of people that would go and hurt others? Yeah. Jesus cleansed mouths that would then go and curse Jesus with it. He opened eyes that would then use those eyes in lust. He is always playing his part yep. even though we continue to fail and fall yeah. because he is grace and truth in the flesh. He is unlike any other. He's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he's beautiful and he's wonderful. And there he is at the meal. And the scripture says that he, he grabs the bread and he breaks the bread, but then he gives thanks. Can we just stop for a moment and just consider that? That Jesus Christ, the author of all life, is taking time to, to be thankful? Why? Because gratitude produces love. And here's Jesus taking time to give thanks for something. I, I love that, like, who is he thanking? He's thanking his father, but it's also something he's modeling for you and I, that we need to have a spirit of gratitude, that we need to walk in thankfulness. I wrote a few things down about thankfulness. Thankfulness protects your perspective. Awesome. When you walk in gratitude, when you realize it's not all about me, man, it's not all eyes on me, it helps me understand that there's other people who played a part in my success and how I got here and I need other people. I'm thankful for the people around me. It protects my perspective. Thankfulness focuses your future. It helps clarify where I'm headed, that I'm moving forward with the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is your strength. It helps you step into the future. I wrote down thankfulness gravitates towards generosity. Isn't this beautiful? That thankful people are generous people. Yeah. That's right. Grateful people are, are, are generous people. Proverbs says the world of the generous gets larger and larger and larger. How do you step into a big world? How do you step into something larger than yourself? You get thankful for where you're at today. Because as you get thankful, you'll start being generous. You'll start giving more than what's required. And when you do that, God begins opening up doors. Yeah. Thankfulness attracts the right attention. I mean, you know that people who are thankful, man, you rarely forget those people. People that are thankful, you, you, you're attracted to that type of person. You want to be around those kinds of people. They're the people you're attracted to and the people that you have a hard time forgetting. Jesus, he models it right here. He just, at this Passover meal, he just takes time and he gives thanks. He, he breaks the bread and then the scripture says he takes the cup. And he blesses it and he gives thanks for the cup. And we need to understand on this Good Friday the significance of Passover. Because Passover is a Jewish holiday that's still celebrated today. But it goes all the way back to when the Israelites 
were slaves in Egypt. For 400 years, they were in bondage in Egypt. Now, coming through this land and being reminded once again of our history, which is your history if you're a follower of Jesus, it's our spiritual history. The Israelites, they, they didn't start in bondage. No, it was sons of Abraham. It was Abraham's son, Isaac, and then Isaac had sons, Jacob and Esau, and then Jacob had 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. Remember the one son, Joseph? They didn't like him because he had a coat of many colors and he had his father's favor, and so he's thrown into a pit, then he's sold into slavery. He ends up in Egypt, it's amazing. It's actually a rescue plan in Egypt. He rises through the ranks, he becomes number two in all of command of Egypt. A famine hits the land of Israel, and with it, all of his brothers have to go to him. Do you know that Joseph is the first story we have in history of forgiveness? That, 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 that Joseph, instead of taking his power and right. accusing his brothers and bringing justice to his brothers, instead, he gives mercy, he forgives them, and he actually gives them power, and he gives them land in Egypt. Yeah. How many know Jesus is the true and better Joseph? Yeah. Yeah. That when you and I, we deserve punishment, we deserve wrath, he doesn't give us wrath and punishment. So Instead, true. he forgives, yeah. gives yeah. us mercy, yeah. gives us what he earned, not what we earn. Yeah. But the Israelites, they lived there for a while, but at some point as Pharaohs grew and years passed, they forgot about Joseph. And with it, they begin to enslave God's people. And for 400 years, the Egyptian empire was built off the backs of God's people. But although they were suffering and although they were going through difficulty, God never forgot about his promise. Yes. And so he raises up a man by the name of Moses. Moses, he has a stuttering problem. He's not very well spoken, but God says, I want you to speak on my behalf. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That God chooses a man who stutters to speak on his behalf. Right. Why? Because he's not calling qualified people. He's qualifying called people. Yeah. It's how he works. It's how his grace behaves. And he sends Moses to Pharaoh. You know the story. Moses, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, um, I don't think I can do that. And so God sends a series of plagues. You got to go back into the Old Testament and hear about the plagues, but it's the plague of frogs. It's the bloody Nile River. There's locusts. There's a series of things. And each time Pharaoh's about to agree, but then his heart is so hard that he chooses not to let God's people go. Until, someone say until. Until till the 10th plague. The 10th plague was the angel of death. And the angel of death, listen to this, was sent in the night to kill the firstborn of every household. Unless, here's the contingency, lamb's blood was painted over the doorpost of the home. So Moses told the Israelites, tonight, before the sun sets, kill a lamb, and paint the blood over the doorpost because when the angel of death comes, every house that has lamb's blood painted over the doorpost, that angel is going to pass over that house. Yeah. Well, all of the Israelites got the word and they obeyed and did what Moses had commanded. The Egyptians did not. And that night as the angel of death came, firstborn all over Egypt were killed in a moment. The morning, Pharaoh said, you guys have got to get out of here. He doesn't just say get out of here. The scripture says that the Israelites, they plundered Egypt. They left with the wealth. They left wealthy on the way out of there. Pharaoh was wanting to get them out of Egypt. How many know the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous? Wow. And the Bible says that the Israelites, millions of them, they, they left out of Egypt. Why? Because lamb's blood was painted over it. And the scripture says in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 12, that every year, every year, Jews had to remember the Passover angel and they would have a feast. They would have a meal, much like Americans today have Thanksgiving. You remember about us finding this land and God prospering it. The first Thanksgiving was the Passover meal. And there was a grocery list, just like at Thanksgiving for many of us Americans. We have to have turkey and mashed potatoes, or if you're really good, you know, jerk chicken, or if you're like Don Cherie, jambalaya. But for them, no, it has to be unleavened bread. There has to be lamb. 
There has to be wine. And what was the system? The system was remember. Remember when God brought you out of slavery. Remember when God set you free. I don't want you to forget. I want you to remember it. Tell your children and your children's children. All year long at Voo Church, starting last year at Vision Sunday, we have been talking about thus far the Lord has helped us, that we raise a stone of help, we raise our Ebenezer, that we lay down memorial markers to testify of the goodness and the faithfulness of God. If you're having a hard time understanding that God has a bright future for you, just look back on your past. Don't forget his faithfulness of the past. It's his faithfulness of the past that's gonna bring you strength in the present. And God says, you need to have this meal. You need to do it this way. You need to remember the day that the angel passed over your house because of the lamb's blood. Remember, remember, remember. But this, in Matthew chapter 26, is Passover, but it's not just Passover. It really is the first communion. It's Good Friday. In the first communion, Jesus changes something. It's quite significant. He doesn't say, remember God. He doesn't say, remember the Passover angel. No, 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 no. He says something that's so important that we must hear on this Good Friday. He says, remember me. And this, my friends, is what we call the new covenant. The old covenant brought a reminder of my sins, but the new covenant brings a remission of my sins. The gospel and the good news of Jesus doesn't make me proud of me. It makes me proud of Jesus. Remember me. R- remember, remember me. I want you to eat this bread knowing this is my body which has been broken for you. I'm about to go and do on that cross what you never could do. I am the perfect sacrifice. I am an atoning sacrifice. I am the propitiation for your sins. I'm trading places with you. You deserve death, but my body is gonna be crushed. I'm gonna be the olive in Gethsemane that's gonna be pressed down. And it's from my blood that I will wash you clean. And it's not a physical freedom, it's a spiritual freedom. So remember me, when you drink this cup and when you eat this bread, remember, remember me. Be thankful for me, because as you get grateful for me, love is gonna be produced. That's what communion is all about and what a moment it is because this Passover meal is different from all of the other Passover meals because this is the first time we have ever seen that we don't just have the lamb on the table. Friends, we have the lamb at the table. That Jesus Christ, he is, according to John, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And much like that lamb all the way back in the book of Exodus, when it's painted over the doorpost that the angel's gonna pass over, I got good news for you. When Jesus' blood is painted over your life, I'm telling you what, the angel will pass over. Wrath doesn't fall upon you, but rather his goodness and his mercy will follow you all the days of your life. I'm thankful today that my firstborn, he doesn't have to be sacrificed. No, God, who's a good father, said, I'll give my firstborn. And his name is Jesus. He'll trade places with you. This, my friends, is what we are remembering from the Mount of Olives. This, my friends, is why we're taking time tonight, today, to simply remember what Jesus did for me. For the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life. I deserve death, you deserve death. We're all sinners, for all have fallen short of the glory of God. But we're not left helpless, we're not left on the ground, not able to get back up. No, Jesus comes and the cross says he loves me, he empathizes with me, but he can take this bad moment and turn it into a beautiful moment. And so I trust in him and I remember on what seems to be a bad Friday, it actually is good good for me, good for you. And much like God said to the Israelites, every year I want you to have this Passover meal. I think we should do it frequently and we should do it often. We should receive communion. We should drink the cup and eat the bread to proclaim the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And so I want you to reach today. The elements have been passed out to you. And I want you to grab that piece of bread for a moment. 
Jesus, he broke it and he gave thanks, which is what I'm gonna do. And I just want you to pull out that cracker, piece of bread at your home. I want you to hold it in your hand for a moment because yes, these are symbols, but I think there's something more than symbols. Uh, the Catholic Church believes that this is the literal body and this is the literal blood. I'm not sure if I can go that far, but I certainly believe there's something supernatural about communion. I probably lean more towards Luther, towards Luther's idea that, that there's a special presence that shows up that as we hold on to it, I know that as I receive the Lord's Supper right now, that He's here in our midst, and I find comfort, and I find joy in that. You know, when we receive communion, it, we're prophesying. You always wanted to have the gift of prophecy? Just, just receive the Lord's Supper, because you are prophesying, prophetically declaring, He's coming back, and when He comes back, He's coming back to this mountain. I know you're not here with us, we're bringing this to you right now. He's coming back to this mountain mountain and I'm prophesying, I'm letting the whole world know, I believe and I declare Jesus is returning. So let's give thanks. Lord, we thank you for your body, which was broken for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you were crushed. By your stripes, we are healed. Lord, as we reflect on what you did 2,000 years ago, it hasn't lost any of its potency. It hasn't lost any of its power. Lord, you were broken, so we really, truly could be made a whole. The world can't satisfy us. Money can't satisfy. Our job can't fulfill. Only you can. It's not a spouse that we need. It's not children that we need. It's you that we need, the one who puts us back together. We give thanks. We give thanks. It's our gratitude that produces our love for you. In Jesus' name, let us eat together. same way the scripture says that he took the cup and when he had given thanks he gave to them saying drink from it all of you this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins I tell you I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom he's saying well this is my last Passover but it's your first communion and the next time I drink with you we will be in heaven. I'm coming back for you. I haven't forgotten you. That's what the cross is shouting today. You're not forsaken. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood. Thank you for the lamb's blood that's painted over my life. I used to grow up in churches. I plead the blood of Jesus. It sounds so Christianese, but it's actually so, so biblical. I plead it. I declare it over my kids and my kids' kids, over you power of God, the protection of God, the safety of God. Lord, we thank you for your blood. We thank you for its power. We thank you that today, Lord, we have been washed clean, that we are white as snow, that, Lord, you don't just forgive our sins, but, Lord, you forget our sins. Thank you, Lord, that things that we're still remembering, you have chosen to forget. We, we, we give you honor, we give you praise. We're not our past, we're not our mistake, we're not our sin. Our shame has no control over us. We surrender that over to you, Jesus. We plead the blood of Jesus. Judgment, death does not come upon us, but rather life, because you see the Lamb's blood over our life. We're hidden in Christ, in Jesus' name. Amen, let us drink together. Can we just all say, thank you, Jesus? Just say, thank you, Jesus. Right there, just in the location that you're in, online, on YouTube, just thank you, Jesus. Fill up the chat right now, just saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. He's here in our midst. He's with us. His body, his blood. I love how it says in verse 30, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. It's so cool that they finish this Passover meal. And as they do so, they start singing and worshiping with Him. Why is that? 
because our belief in God, it ought to lead to doxology. It ought to lead to worship, to praise, that we would give Him praise, that we would sing. Why? Because when gratitude is experienced, love is expressed. When I remember what Jesus did for me, I can't help but yes. worship Him. Yeah. Just get this idea that they sang a hymn and then they headed to the Mount of Olives. They left the city of life and they made their way over to the city of death. They knew where they were headed. Jesus knew what awaited Him. But before they did, they took a moment to sing and we don't know exactly what they sang, but what many people understand about the Passover meals, that there's certain hymns that were picked. Psalm 118 is one of those hymns. And I actually asked Manu to read Psalm 118, because I think on this night, on Good Friday, which we remember the death of Jesus, I think we ought to end this night in worship and praise, remembering his love for us, his death, his sacrifice, and it ought to lead to us praising him. And what do they sing? I think it was Psalm 118. Manu, why don't you read it for us before we worship? Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his love endures forever. When hard pressed, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All the nations surround me, but the name of the Lord, I cut them down. They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them down. They swarmed around me like bees, but they were consumed as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them down. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die, but live. I will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord chastised me se severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God. He has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. If you believe it, why don't you put your hands together? Let's just give God praise. Hey, this is Rich and Don Sheree Wilkerson, and we want to say thank you so much for watching and engaging with today's content. Maybe today you want to make the decision to follow Jesus. Why don't you pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, today I choose to entrust my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me a new creation. I love you, in Jesus' name, amen. We're celebrating with you the decision that you've made, and we wanna walk this journey out alongside you. Yeah, and if you just prayed that prayer, why don't you go ahead and follow the prompts that are on the screen right now? We're so glad that you took some time to watch today's message. Do us a favor, if it encouraged you, if it impacted you, go ahead and share this. And if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to the Voo Church YouTube channel so you can continue to get more content like this. We love you guys, and we're declaring the best is yet to, to come. come.